every time I think of you I always catch my breath Sometimes I wonder how I'd ever make it through Through this world without having you Go your way, I'll go mine Now the train is broken Hey guys, Kathy Rankin here with BrickHouse.tv at BLK Live. You can see we're in the middle of a sound check, but we want to talk about our recent interview with John Waite, such a well-respected musician in the industry, and hands down one of the nicest people you've ever met. He's always kind of flown under the radar. We talked about that. We talked about his art, his craft, but I got to tell you, this guy has a wicked sense of humor, and it was one of the most fun interviews we've done. Take a look. Hey guys, Kathy Rankin here with BrickHouse.tv at BLK Live on a glorious day. 77 degrees in Scottsdale and it's even more glorious because I get to talk to one of my favorite musicians, John uh, Waite. Yes. Thank you. Big fan. You're welcome. Thank you for talking to us. Absolutely. Um, so, John, there's yes. so much I'd like to ask you. I'll yes. try and keep myself in check. It's okay. I wanted to talk to you first. I interview a lot of the artists that come yeah. here. and. I usually go to the website just to yeah. kind of get a feel for what you guys say about yourselves. Yeah. And honestly, a lot of musicians don't even know what is on their own website. Well, and yours, yeah. <laughs> hold on before you answer, <laughs> yours is incredibly well written. It is. It is. It is. Did you have any input in that? Yeah, a lot of it's just stuff I edited together. But I mean, we brought people in to sort of like do the same thing, but from a different standpoint. You know, I mean, if you talk about yourself all the time, it's usually like, you know, all positive. Yeah. And so I like it when it, get, I like it, when it gets negative. You know? <laughs> I like it when it gets all truthful and dark. Well, it was very deep. I mean, was it? It was. It actually was. There's a lot of a lot of articles on there written in the first person about your days in New York. Ah, uh, yeah. You actually go through each album and give stories. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, honestly, compared to a lot of the sites I see, it was very well rounded yeah. and. The reason I bring it up is because to me, it speaks to exactly who you are as an artist. Thank you. And your songwriting. Yeah. And <clears throat> that seems to be the connection that I think has um, resonated with fans for such a long career. So I wanted to ask about that. Is there an aha moment you remember or a specific age when you just knew within yourself that you had to do this? Well, I was, when I was a kid, my, my family was very musical. My cousin Michael was in a, a, a trad jazz band, and my brother took up the guitar when he was about 11. My mom played the piano, and my dad was into classical music, so from the word go, I was in a, a musical kind of setting. Gotcha. And you couldn't really, there was no MTV, there was no mainstream radio, there was just Radio Luxembourg and people that had records in the neighborhood. You'd go and find them and trade records and stuff. Right. But it was never any it was never any doubt about it. I went to art school, I wanted to be a painter, but all the time I was like studying art and sort of, you know, doing all that art school kind of thing. I was playing in a band and I was always listening to music. So the two things sort of converged and then separated when I realized I wasn't gonna be a great painter or a great artist. I knew I could do something that was more original if I just stuck with what I was. The, the stuff I was listening to was kind of faulty. It was like old blues guys. Mm -hmm. And then Neil Young came out. And Neil Young had this really high voice that was quite powerful. It was very unusual. At the same time, the seeds of punk rock were starting. Mm -hmm. There was a direct parallel between punk and Neil's attitude of like verite recording, like Tonight's the Night, mm -hmm. stuff like that. It was very, very dark and true and real and first take stuff. And he's also. You know, he's a tremendous talent too, but he was a romantic figure that seemed like a loner and stuff. He was like my Elvis in some ways. He had a big impact on me, so I just jumped in. Really. Yeah. yeah. So even as a youngster, did you have... <laughs> take a breath. <laughs> even as a youngster, did you have... Uh, were you kind of a deep kid? I mean, you're... Off deep? Deep. Were you kind of deep? I mean, your lyrics are well, you know, very intense and emotionally charged. I mean, you're not, it, your stuff isn't just surface. Well, I try to, uh, I only can write about myself. Some people, I, I've tried writing for the charts, and I couldn't really do it. Uh, when Bad English did When I See You Smile, that was uh, a Diane Warren song. I just couldn't right. write that kind of stuff. And it's, people have said, well, why, you know, your career isn't what it should be because you can't write those. But I don't want to, really. I try to sort of almost anti-melody because I hate being so mainstream. And lyrics 
when I first got the job with the babies to write songs because they couldn't write songs I was writing about my life and I was writing about some sort of personal aspect said so and then they would take that and beat the crap out of it you know as a rock band right and suddenly things like you know Head Above the Waves or Wild Man and all those I Believe in Love became songs like Free and they became a kind of blues and then I realized what it was because it had been shaped by them and I could move into that and develop it so my writing always existed pretty strong right from the word go because mm -hmm. once you get a, a deadline you're kind of in yeah you know? yeah that's all there is and it's <clears> funny <throat> that you say that because that was one of the things I was going to tell you from a fan perspective you you've had a lot of commercial success yeah um, but you always seemed like a guy who kind of flew under the radar to me and yeah, it well, really yeah. was just about the message you yeah. you felt in, compelled to tell and the stories you felt compelled You're to good, tell. Aren't you? <laughs> good. Hey, I we like got that a, on camera. I love no, that. No, no, it was good. That well, I, I just seen the day. I mean, I remember doing Saturday Night Live, and I wouldn't do what they told me. Oh, yeah. And I, so I did one song. I wouldn't do Missing. I did Saturday Night, and then they kind of booted me off the show. <laughs> but I was. But I remember in that period, I absolutely hated being number one. I hated people thinking you were just some sort of uh, accessible image that they could like use, pick up, and talk about store and, and mm -hmm. throw away you know I, I i took one look at him and like it's great to be here thanks for the ride i'll be over in the back room writing a song or having a martini or something and yeah I, once you achieve that it's like i just didn't need it or want to i made a ton of money bought a big house and moved out of the city and uh that was the reward of being number one but i just wanted to get back to being a songwriter and be left to that device mm -hmm. you know but so then how did you deal with the whole fame side of it because you know, you have no control over that, but that's what happened. Yeah, but if you step back, it, I mean, people who, who don't want to be in the, the gossip columns and mm -hmm. they come out of hotels with their lovers and stuff at right. six in the morning, right. looking all beat up, <laughs> right. and then it gets in like E Weekly and stuff, you could go out the back. Yeah. If you really don't want it, you can really avoid it. Yeah. And it's a game that the, the, the paparazzi play with the artists and the PR people. But if you really say, get the fuck out of my life, you know, they really will. You can you can you kind can, of control how you. You honestly can, and I did. I just took the back entrance, and uh, I I just wasn't into playing the game. I, I found it amusing and fun and great for about like two months. Then it was like, well, I got to go now. Yeah. And it was like, no, but there's a party tonight or a reception, or you got to do this and that. Yeah, but I got to go now. But that's where I bought the house in the country and just disappeared. So what do you like to do when you're not being the artist and you're not writing songs and, and being a professional musician? What What is your is, idea of downtime and fun? I read quite a lot. And uh, I like to travel. And we, we work a lot. So I'm either recovering from coming back from a trip or we're on the road playing a gig. But the two things, I don't like being off the road too long because it, it you become stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, but I... When, it, when things get that bad that we're not working for two months, I just record, you know, write songs. Do you see yourself doing this for the rest of your life? Is there ever a time where you see yourself stepping back? Or, or is there another way you want to express yourself in a different type of art? Oh, that was good. Yeah, you are good. <laughs> uh, no, Gosh, I love interviews well, like on. this. Well, all I could really write about at this point is looking over my shoulder. Yeah. Because I've written a lot about the middle part of my life, the first part, and now I'm in the sort of end, you know, decades of whatever is left to me. And I, I don't want to sort of be bruised. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love this place. I wish it was more peaceful, but life is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's great work to be done, and there's, there's conversations to have, and there's, there's people to meet, and handshakes to be made, and, and a truce. You know, people have to live together and, and understand each other. And compassion has to come into this somewhere and we all have to grow up. Mm -hmm. We really, truly do. It's America, you know? Yeah, And I, I think as long as that's on the table, there's always work to do. Mm -hmm. Whether it's me with an acoustic guitar on a street corner or my full band or, or me trying to do something to sort of bridge that gap. But that's the work. And it's more than just music. It's about the spirit of everything, really. And this is cool because I did uh, <clears throat> read something about where you were talking about earlier when you wanted to be a painter yeah you didn't it's the article said you couldn't express yourself fast yeah, enough so you true. got into music yeah because you yeah. wanted to make a mark so i know from the pa fans point of view they feel you've made a mark how do you personally feel do you feel you've made the mark and what was the mark you wanted to make 
Well, I don't think I... I think people who, who look at their own work, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and say how great they are, yes, I did this, and boy, that was my shining moment, they're usually complete crap. I mean, <laughs> they really are. Yeah. It's just like measuring against sales or something. You're never done. The painting is never finished. The mm -hmm. song always goes on. Once you finish one piece of work, you look at it and you think, I could have done that better. There's always a, a simpler way of saying it and a, a more biting, cutting, accessible way that's intelligent, that isn't patronizes the audience. Poetry, you might call it, Bob Dylan, you know, whatever it is, mm -hmm. great writers, but the challenge is there to write the ultimate Zen song that's so simple, uh, you wonder how you did it. Yeah. And that goes on. That's why the blues is so powerful. It's just yeah. very simple in country, early country. Well, and that's what's interesting, interesting to me. I grew up, uh, I spent four years in Scotland when I was younger. Oh, God bless you. What about? <laughs> we were in Edinburgh the first time <laughs> and the second time in Falkland, in Fife. Little, oh, really? Yeah, Little Cobblestone Village in Fife, Falkland. Wow, do you and like that? I, lo I loved Isn't it. it beautiful? It's beautiful. I have such great memories of yeah. Scotland. And so, of course, we spent a lot of time in Britain. And I'm just wondering, how did a little British kid get exposed to country? Because I know when we watched Top of the Pops, it was ABBA and Brian yeah. Ferry and Elton yeah. John. And no, but when I was a little kid, there really wasn't anything else but, like, uh, rockabilly. Uh, like Gene Vincent kind of rock. And uh, Jim Reeves. And when I was about six, I fell in love with Brenda Lee. Oh, God, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. everybody loves me but you. I remember uh, hearing that and my heart broke, and I thought, one of these days. And there was Marty Robbins, it was all Western songs. And you put the TV on, the black and white TV, mm -hmm. and it'd be Champion the Wonder Horse, you know, or the, just these Westerns with some, yeah. with some some singer really overdoing the match. <laughs> right. it it it's like bull whips cracking and guns yeah. going off. This guy's singing about being a lonesome cowpoke. And yeah. it really appealed to the five-year-old in me. It was like, you know, let's go. Go I watch wanna... McKenna's Gold. I, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yeah. It's sort of a spaghetti Western, but it's hysterical. Really? McKenna's Gold? Oh, I've seen it. The opening song oh, is man. classic. Really? It's classic. Oh, you got to go stuff. watch it. It's so unselfconscious. Yeah. You know? It's funny. Oh, man. So um, one thing I noticed in Soundcheck, yeah. uh, you you still have such a thick British accent, but really? when you sing, you don't sound I British that, at all. I get that a lot, but I think when people sing, that they, they really don't. I mean, I enunciate the right words. Mm -hmm. I enunciate my words because I'm English. But I, uh, I don't know that. I mean, they say that when you sing, you lose all your your country, which would be a beautiful thing. Yeah. If you know, I'd like to teach the world to sing. Same uh, voice. Right? <laughs> Look at what we're coming up with on the hey, spot. Hey, hold on. Give me a coke, somebody. <laughs> yeah. No, no, seriously. I, well, it's, I, I don't know why that is. I, don't, it's not, it's, I know people that when they start singing, they start singing with a Western twang and stuff. And I say, come on, you know. That isn't how you talk. Yeah. And they go, well, I am going down last <laughs> highway with a six-pack in my hand. Oh, my God. You're going to do a country album next. I can no, feel no, it. No, that, that's bro country. Yeah. That's that's That's... <laughs> That's hats. That's uh, <laughs> that's Stetsons in the wind. That's just not country. That's okay, not. last thing, and then yeah. I will let you go from this. I'm enjoying this. Torturously no, long really interview. Good. No, uh, I'm really enjoying it. Oh, good. I'm glad. Good I'm glad. I'm yeah. glad. Um, so, last thing, tell people whatever you want to tell them about this tour. You're mixing mm. some acoustic, yeah, some of the electric band. But yeah. uh, what do you what do you want to accomplish on this tour, and what do you <laughs> want the fans to come and be open to? Well, that's a good question too. Um, well, I've always loved the acoustic guitar and I wrote everything that was worth anything on it. And it's always been a big part of my life since I was a kid. And when I left Bad English and I was back in New York City, I was playing the acoustic all the time because you can't plug in at two in the morning, you'll get evicted, you know. <laughs> so I had this Martin guitar and I would write songs and, and it just, the songs became more and more uh, naked and uh, stripped down. And they really had more meaning to me after the big production of Bad English. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to back away from that. Made a record called Temple Bar. That was probably the best thing I'd done to that point. Mm -hmm. And that encouraged me to just go off and pursue this direction. It's electric, but there's always the acoustic in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. And um, it was influenced by early country. And it was influenced by blues. And great writers that I'd been reading or listening to. But this tour is based on the Wooden Heart releases. Right. There's two, there's an EP and an album called Wooden Heart 1 and 2, Volume 1 and Volume 2. And it's acoustic renditions of the hits like Isn't It Time, Missing You, uh, alongside songs like Masterpiece of Loneliness and uh, In God's Shadow. 
Mm. Uh, so many good songs. There's really good songs and they really speak. If you, It's a challenge to go out there and play them acoustically because you can't, you can't use reverb and effects and all this stuff. To, you can't in any way. It's just you and the audience. Yeah. And it's so honest that it's worth doing. Yeah, it's organic. Uh, yeah. And then you watch like, the, the arena rock thing. Yeah. And they've got every kind of tape going and they're lip syncing and they've got effects on everything. And you look and go, oh, Christ, you know? You might as well just go and watch them on TV or something. Yeah. You know? It's just crap. Yeah. So to me, it's an extreme challenge. But we, we have a three-piece band with me at the front. I'm playing acoustic. We switch to electric. We have a small drum kit and bass. And it's like a rock show. It just pivots between being acoustic and a pivot. That was a good word for Yeah, that. Yeah. that was a good word. And then it goes rock and then it goes back to the acoustic and then it goes out and then when we do big festivals or theaters or whatever we use a four-piece band with me at the front and that's just some more flat out rock but we always do things like bluebird cafe no mm -hmm. matter what and you put that along isn't it time or missing you or back of my feet again midnight rendezvous head first you do change yeah i love that song thank you just a personal favorite yeah no, 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 no. We, do, we, try to, <laughs> we try and do it more but the more you in, the, the the longer you've been out there yeah you've got a lot of material to choose I from i know but people only really remember the singles after about two decades it's just the singles so you're trying to please people and yet make it an artistic interesting evening but like you're trying to really deliver yeah what they want to hear but also challenge them a little bit and challenge yourself by doing that yeah well, I have so enjoyed talking to Thank you. you. And so this I enjoyed is, it too. This is my first time getting to see you live, so I am Oh, it's terrible. Super <laughs> <laughs> You're smiling now. <laughs> Just wait. It usually ends in tears, you know. I'll be in stuff. tears on missing yeah, you. No, the I, no, you'll, the see me on, down. you'll see me on the side of stage yeah. oh, really? blub blubbering like Aww. a little baby. Yeah. Stop. But uh, I'm very excited. It's Thank a you. lot of people are looking forward to this Thank show. You. So Thank you. good luck tonight and Thank I will you. be seeing you when you're all dressed and ready for the stage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Unless this is what you're wearing. Yeah, okay, no, I'll put then something else on. Then that was majorly No, I'll have to put something on. No, I've, I've got something else I can put on. Just wondering <laughs> if you brought a chain of clothes, that's all. <laughs> Well, as you can see, between John and I, we couldn't shut up. The camera guy actually had to tell us to cut it, and we had to end the interview. But we wanted to just keep talking. He was so much fun and really the nicest guy ever. Gave a great performance. The audience absolutely loved it, and he sounds incredible to this day. So if you ever get a chance to see him, go see him live. It's well worth it. We'll see you guys again at the next show. What do you think of that? In this world, could ever do with the touch of your hand.